Hello and welcome to Morning Coffee and Maestros. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the importance of paying it forward, about the importance of mentors in our lives. So many of us stand on the shoulders of those who saw something in us, who invested in our lives and taught us not only about music, but about life. We are better people and musicians because of these extraordinary people. This episode is really about gratitude. We're so thankful for these amazing teachers, colleagues, performers, conductors, and family members who showed through their actions the art of paying it forward. And we want to thank you for your submissions to today's conversation. We received so many great stories about your mentors, and and we look forward to sharing many of those during this episode. If you'd like to join in the conversation, please share a paragraph about a mentor that made a difference in your life. You can, add the, you can do this by adding a comment on Facebook or using the live chat function on YouTube. I know. Well, before we jump right in, I like the seersucker suit. That's oh, thank very, you. I, very I, nice. I, I didn't know we were dressing up today. I'm sorry. I just I felt like, you know, if I was going to put up my baby picture today, I should look somewhere. Where you have baby pictures? I have a baby picture. I do. I didn't bring any baby <laughs> pictures, but I'm not, I, was not, I was not a cute baby. I was just a big, fat, rolly guy. Some people would say it hasn't changed much in all the time. <laughs> So uh, let's jump into it. We have a lot of great uh, content we want to share with you today, so many of these great stories. Um, And as students return to school, we're reminded about how important band teachers and choir teachers and um, orchestra conductors are to our youth because these gifted teachers, they inspire, they give endlessly, and they leave uh, leave positive impressions that last an entire lifetime. And um, I know with, uh, with COVID right now, we have so many of our friends and uh, colleagues that are, are going back to school. And I think now it's, it's really timely. I know I, I think about Elizabeth Granowitz, who's got her, 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 her face mask with her music and her everything else. But they're, they're doing um, such great work in such troubling times. And I'm just so proud of, um, I'm always proud of our music teachers. But now especially, I can't imagine how... Um, difficult that must be. And so, you know, when we think about high school uh, teachers, they're really almost a lot of times the first people that really make a difference in our lives. And um, I know for me, my first one was uh, uh, my band teacher, Alan Madison. And Alan was, uh, was the first person who looked, looked into my eyes and said, you know, you have some talent. You, you're really good at this. And I, and I thought to myself, everybody else has been telling me I wasn't good at this. Uh, but he really, he, he saw something in me and he, he, he kind of gave me the encouragement I needed to say, you know, maybe you want to consider a life in music. And one of the things uh, um, he did, he was the first person to teach me how to conduct. So he gave me my little three pattern and my four, four pattern. And usually, um, if you're a senior, you're going to be the drum major for the marching band. Well, I was a drum major for three years. So I got to conduct all the halftime shows, even though you're not really conducting, they're just not, they're doing their own thing. But um, what our tradition was at, in Belmont High School was um, uh, the band teacher would always conduct the Star Spangled Banner, and then the drum major or majorette would conduct the halftime mm-hmm. show. But for my entire senior year, I got to conduct the national anthem. Wow. And um, he gave me so many conducting opportunities. He wow. let me conduct the pep band. Um, when it, my last two years, we did the, when we had solo state ensemble uh, contest. What he would do is we would each have about ten or twelve groups, and he would go, "Here you go." Oh. And so as a junior in high school, I think, I think my junior or my senior year, I got more, I got more ones than he did. But I think, he, I think he gave me the better kids. I think that's kind of part of what it is. And, and uh, you know, I was a really small school. Um, we were 32. Uh, my graduating class was 32. Jeez. I think we have 32 sopranos in Key Corral. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, we have about 40. Uh, but uh, it was interesting uh, to me because it was such a small school. We had great bands, great choirs. And um, we had um, myself and Deanna and Deji, three of us within two years, that make our, our living in music this day, these days, which is really unusual. I think that kind of shows you how important these mentors can be. Um, to have three of us that uh, have, have made our living uh, in music, uh, and we were surrounded by cornfields in the middle of Iowa. Wow. And uh, we went, all of us went back for his, uh, his retirement. And uh, he didn't know any of us were coming, and it was all of his students came back, and and uh, we did uh, we did an arrangement of leader of the band and That's all awesome. of those things. But it was so it was it was just so nice to come back um, to see Alan and to and to share with him, um, you know, all the things that that made a difference. So I think you know, band teachers and choir directors, they're they're sometimes the people that make the first, really that first light that spark. 
It's true. I, I will never forget high school. You know, I grew up in a, in a black Baptist church, but I had never heard classical choral music um, and was a violinist playing in orchestras and things like that. Uh, and it wasn't until high school that my first English teacher, Mr. Walter Storff, um, was the high school chorus teacher. And he would conduct like the Illinois State choirs and things like that. Um, but that was like the first place I'd ever heard classical choral music, n- not realizing that it would <coughs> shape my life. And he left, um, he retired. So when I was able to get into choir, we had this guy um, whose last name was Bates. And so, you know, high school students, I were, do know. we were pretty ruthless with, <laughs> with calling him choir master, you know, Bates. But uh, he let me conduct portions of Handel's Messiah with our, with our choir. So I, high school is such a unique experience for those who, who make the point of having band and orchestra and choruses in there because uh, I wonder if it wasn't for high school, had, it, had I, would I have ever kind of found a passion for, for classical choral music? Yeah, so. I know I wouldn't. And I know uh, we have a submission here from Charlene McLean, who's one of our 40 sopranos. Yes. And it kind of highlights this. So. <laughs> well... Charlene says, my high school choral teacher was wonderful. He was a graduate of Juilliard, so people would often ask him why he was teaching in high school. His reply, and also what he told us, his students, was that we were in school to learn math, English, history, science, etc. We were also there to learn music. Nice. So we would not be doing much of the popular music of the day, but we would do classics, and we did. We sang the Hallelujah Chorus from from Messiah, Beethoven's Hallelujah, and, and much more. I fell in love with classical choral music, and it's my favorite to this day. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, that's, that's what I think is so great about these high school people. They, they really are the, the first time a lot of us mm-hmm. get that real spark. Um, I have another submission here from Nancy Olson. Nancy is our amazing accompanist of Key Chorale, and she says, There is one mentor that came into my life when I was a junior in high school. I still communicate with him today. Even though he is now 87 and living outside Philadelphia, Robert Carwithen was my second organ teacher and later one of my early conducting professors at Westminster Choir College. He was known as a brilliant organist, choral conductor, Carrie Lenore, I have a hard time saying that word, (laughs) Carrie Lenore, uh, church musician, bell ringer we would say, a composer, arranger, (laughs) and performer. I remember when he took me at the age of 16 on an organ crawl to see the antiphonal pipes, including several 32-footers at his church in Germantown, Pennsylvania. To get there, we had to walk through the attic, which was not completely floored, and at one point had to walk over a single beam, where if there had been one misstep, it would have sent us plummeting through the ceiling and into the pews far below. Luckily, my parents never knew. I never forgot it, and I also learned how an organ works. Robert continued to foster my love of choral music and accompanying after graduation from Westminster. He took me on as his assistant conductor for the Germantown Oratorio Society, Mm That's where I first learned and helped prepare Mendelssohn's Elijah and Britain's St. Nicholas, among so many other works, and would play organ in countless performances. His love of music, appreciation of the choral texts, and inspiration to always look deeper stays with me to this day. Wow. I tell you, I don't know anyone that's done an organ crawl that has not uh, (laughs) wanted to immediately become an organist. I will never forget when I was a kid... um, my, mom, my grandmother had left her church that she'd been going to for close to 50 years and started going to a new church. And there was a guy there by the name of Merrill Dunlop. And Merrill Dunlop was, he died, or I think he was 95 or 96 when he died. But I remember up to the week in which he fell really sick, this guy was playing Bach preludes and fugues. And I don't mean from the, from the eight prelude, not the easy ones. I mean, <laughs> flawlessly playing to Cot and F and, and all these wonderful works up until his death. And I'll never forget the first time I went to church with my grandmother and heard this big three manual Aeolian Skinner with four 32 foot uh, pipes. And he, he couldn't physically go up there anymore, but he told me there it got to go see all the organ pipes and and from that moment on I was like at some point in my life I've got to play play the organ and and 
I just I think about all these different, you know, maybe not so much for me a mentor specifically, but all of these people who from the sidelines almost play a major impact in in the rest of your life when it comes to music. So it's true, and I think when you, when you what I think about it is is just the idea of when well, when it's happening in real time, you don't really notice this incredible generosity and all these things. But when you get older and you look back and you go, wow, every one of those points of contact made me a better person, mm -hmm. informed life in a different way. And I bet you this person you're going to talk about, Lucinda Ali, is probably in that category. Yeah, so before I get into Lucinda, I kind of have to give a few, a few memories getting up to there. So the first picture that you will see up here, uh, I don't know if you can see it yet. Oh, my God. Uh, but that I, is I captain. I that tell is you. that is baby me. So just looking wow. at that picture, you knew I was destined to be a leader of something. I had to be in control. I was. I think I was you looked like you were ready to pilot the <laughs> HMS Pinafore. <laughs> <laughs> I was the captain of something, and I think my mom seeing me look like that and dress like that automatically knew. I've got to be a musician of some, <laughs> some <laughs> sort. So the first person that really played the early, early, uh, that laid the foundations for me was my grandmother. Um, I, think there, I think you have a picture of her up there. Um, oh, but that, yeah. was, that was my grandmother who, who died when I, three months into my move here to, to Venice and Sarasota, Florida. And she was a musician all her life, never had the opportunity to become a professional musician. Um, and, you know, she, she just wanted one of her kids or one of her grandkids to be a professional musician. Um, and so me and my grandmother had, we just had the same love of everything. And regardless as to what a any other other cousins say I know that I was the favorite grandchild <laughs> <laughs> but um, she just to have someone who understood me um, in, in a, such a deep way musically and spiritually uh, was just super important and then my mom, and there's a picture of her up there, my mom played a major, major um, role in, in everything that I am today. She put me in conservatory when I was four years old. And you took these general music classes. You know, they, they taught you about percussion and piano and strings, and they gave you enough music theory that you could comprehend for a four-year-old kid. <laughs> so I was taking music theory at the age of four. <laughs> and then after a year of that program, um, you went and toured the conservatory. You went to the string department. You went to the keyboard department. Um, and I remember walking into the piano department, and they were doing a master class. And I just fell in love. I was like, that's what I want to do. And my mom said, no, there's no way I'm buying <laughs> you a piano. <laughs> and so then we walked over to the strings and there was a violin class going on and I was not at all into the violin thing I just like no I want to play piano I want to play piano and I think my mom saw this classroom of of diversity and a black woman teaching violin and not just a black woman but an extremely accomplished black woman mm -hmm. Uh, who was playing with Chicago Symphonietta and, th and things like that. Um, and so this is Lucinda Ali, who <coughs> was my violin teacher from age five until 16. Wow. And not only did she display just great musicianship, but she left Sherwood Conservatory and started her own music school. Um, and And... She grew it to be this organization that has had students going to play at Obama's uh, in the White House for the Obamas, have won national and international competitions. She has built this school 
of just incredible musicians. And it was because of her that I had the opportunity to, to do a master class and, and perform for Rachel Barton Pine. And it was, I, I remember vividly doing a few performances uh, for Rachel Barton Pine. Um, and we even did one, which I believe was aired on PBS, if I'm not mistaken, of black classical musicians. We actually performed violin works by black classical musician composers. Mm -hmm. um, and so Lucinda has played a major role in my development as, as a musician, as, a, as an African-American classical musician, someone that I will always remember and someone that makes me feel old because now her oldest daughter is in college and I remember when those kids were <laughs> born. Um, and she has given a lot to the, the music and arts community of Chicago. And I don't think she nearly does get, she gets the praise and accolades that she deserves, um, not just for teaching, but like I said, it's not even, it's, it's African American students that are, that she has taught and, and, and coached who are winning national and international competitions. And it's that from, from an African American perspective, seeing someone like that who, can leave a prestigious conservatory for mm -hmm. and and go and start her own conservatory program and grow it to be what it is today um, just is a major major um, impact on my life and it, it was because of my mom uh, that I I had that experience um, you know it was it wasn't just the experience of taking music and having string quartets and all this and, and master classes, but it was also just the experience of every Saturday before before group classes and, and chamber ensembles, me and my mom would go to breakfast together yep. and then we'd go down to Buckingham Fountain and have a really disgusting hot dog. <laughs> um, but it's 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 the collection of those memories um that that I, I think has shaped me to be who I am. So whether or not I remain a professional musician for the rest of my life, um, I'll always have those memories that shaped me, not just as a musician, but as, as a person. Yeah, I think uh, so many times, you know, it's teachers, but it's also family, as you mm -hmm. talked about with Bessie and your grandmother. And, and uh, we have a submission here from uh, Lorraine Murphy, who's our soprano section leader. And um, <clears throat> she has this uh, recollection of her mother. My earliest recollections of musical mentoring were given by my mother, Ella Mae Murphy. Even though we did not know it was called mentoring in the day, she saw that her first little bird had a note to sing and arranged for me to cut a record at age five, along with my sister, age four, and my brother, age three. It was at one of those walk-in recording studios in downtown Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I don't remember the song we sang, but I do know that she walked out in about an hour record in hand of the three of us singing. Mm. And it is also a, quotes recorded fact that I was heard saying to my siblings on that 78 RPM vinyl, help me sing, my voice is getting tired. <laughs> As a single parent, she made many sacrifices to promote my musical growth, helped me clean the piano professor's home in exchange for piano lessons, picked and peddled fruits and vegetables in the little red wagon down the streets of our town for extra money for singing lessons, Saved dollars to buy sheet music and having my dresses made from flowery print feed sacks mm. donated by farmer friends. Many years later, she had an opening night. Uh, sh uh, she had an opening night gift of a Fostoria glass pitcher waiting on my dressing table backstage. The note attached said, "In honor of your first opera role as Adele and De Fledermaus." Cheers. I raise a glass of bubbly to my mother's memory. And in deep appreciation, a deep appreciation, I often look heavenward before I sing a key chorale concert or a solo in church and whisper to the maker of music, mm. thank you, my angel. Wow. That's, wow. You know, just the tenacity of a single parent, single mom, too. Right. And I, I definitely resonate with you, uh, Lorraine. Although my mom, I love her to death, could not cook or sew, uh, so thank God for my grandmother, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I definitely, definitely recognize the tenacity, the strength 
it takes for a single parent not just to raise raise you know children by themselves but also to invest in their music um, yep you know we have another submission here this one is from bob wenberg bob yes. is our uh one of our core singers of bass and uh, our education chair and uh what does he say as a fifth of six children growing up in Long Island, New York, my parents saw my early interest in music. At the age of four, my parents found a voice teacher for me who ultimately was not only a tremendous voice teacher, but, a signi- but became a significant mentor in my life. Miss Emma Foos was a mezzo-soprano, I hope I said that right. Foos, yep. Foos, who was originally from Vienna, Austria, and sang in a number of opera houses throughout Europe. My voice lessons in the beginning consisted of correct breathing mech- methods, vowel and consonant pronunciation, and, simp- and singing simple songs such as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. By the age of eight, Miss Foose had me singing in four different languages. Man, that's impressive. <laughs> I know. Good for you, Bob. <laughs> As a boy soprano, well, we sh- I mean... And now he's a bass was, too. Was he, was he, were you singing Elijah at that time? <laughs> <laughs> he might have been. As a boy soprano, she encouraged me not to settle for average in my singing. She was tough as nails, but I always knew she cared about me and wanted the best for me. At the age of 12, I started participating in recitals and concerts that Miss Foose would have throughout Long Island. I was her youngest student, and most of her other students were in their 20s and were apprentices of aspiring singers who wanted to perform at the Metropolitan Opera. She always encouraged me to do my best, but also to have fun, singing solos at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, local churches, and a local television station in New York were great opportunities and experiences for me as a child. She always gave me feedback at my next voice lesson as to what I did well and what I need to improve on. As I started to sing at my junior high school in chorus and other special events, I found myself being bullied by other kids who did not find singing or the kind of music I like to sing to be cool. It was a different time. I was devastated by being called names. However, Ms. Foose encouraged me to rise above the bullying and focus even more on my love of singing and making beautiful music for others. When I was singing, I was happy. She built me up in a way that helped me to see beyond the bullying I was experiencing. As I approached my junior year of high school, <clears throat> Ms. Foos helped me with the process of applying for college. I was the first of the six children in my family to aspire to go to college. She helped me to prepare vocally for multiple college vocal auditions. I was accepted and attended Valparaiso University in Indiana. What a good Lutheran. <laughs> I'm so grateful to Ms. Foos for not only being a great voice teacher, but also the major impact on my life as a mentor from the age of four to the age of 18. Her impact lasted well beyond the voice lessons and concerts. Her mentoring impacted my life and career as a singer, choral music, educator, school administrator, and college professor. I always remember the focus on the needs of the individual student, be compassionate, and recognize that every student can make a difference in this world. Thank you, Ms. Foos. That's a very wow. good one. I tell you, I, I saw that one uh, this week, and it, it really touched me, because if you know <clears throat> you, know, you know Bob, you know, his, um, he's full of compassion. And, uh, you know, so many times the traits that we have, you know, we attribute from the people that we respect. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's the case um, with, with Bob and Miss Foose. I have another submission. This is from uh, Bharat Chandra. Uh, Bharat is a, is a dear friend. He's a principal clarinet of the Sarasota Orchestra and the best living clarinetist I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, this is a picture of Bharat here and I. Um, at one of the musical highlights of my career, um, we did uh, the Mozart uh, clarinet concerto. And um, if you're going to have, if Richard Stoltman's, Stoltzman's not available, uh, Barat would be your next choice. And uh, mm-hmm. it was just a transcendent performance. Um, Barat is an incredible musician. Uh, I always say about Barat, he can play a whole note and it'll make me cry. But during COVID, I, I cry a lot. So there'll be some of that today, I'm sure. But he has... Excuse me, this really great submission. So he says, if there is one commonality through any group of musicians, it might be their gratitude for those around them and for those of the past, a knowledge of our interwoven lineage as thread is to fabric. Gratitude for these helping hands lent knowingly 
and repayable only into the future. Steve Adams was my band teacher at Shawnee Mission South High School in Overland Park, Kansas, my first musical mentor. His principled motivations, ever-evolving analogies, squinting smiles, and unassuming demeanor would still be uniquely recognizable and memorable to thousands of students who have been under his guidance, and to none more than me. During the late 80s, I was a teenager with a love for music, a complicated home life, and a clarinet. The clarinet didn't have much of a role back then, so I thought. In middle school, the best it had done was keep me in band class with a pretty blonde flute player. So that's not a bad thing. I was ready to quit the clarinet by the end of middle school. If it weren't for Steve, who regularly visited the elementary and middle school programs in the area, he pulled me aside one day and told me to keep going, that he believed I had raw talent and just, raw talent and just needed some help with the instrument. The truth was that I needed lessons, and I had never had them. My parents, I was sure, couldn't afford them. I told Steve this, and he listened compassionately. Before long, Steve had made arrangements with his best high school senior clarinetist to meet me at the middle school and give me half-hour lessons for $5 each. Mm. Those lessons changed my life. Within months, I was at home in front of my boombox every day, passionately trying to play along with the likes of Sabine Meyer and Richard Stoltzman. I had audio cassettes and sheet music and someone to show me how to do the things I'd never understood before. I loved it like nothing else. Steve reappeared in my life the next year in front of our marching band, which he treated with the same care and discipline as his symphonic band. He'd heard my drastic improvement from the summer and offered me my first chances at musical leadership within the freshman group. By the time our first year had ended, I'd risen to become the second chair in our symphonic band, right next to my wonderful first teacher, and somehow we even managed all state honors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Steve took my progress in stride and after the first year, found further opportunities for me to grow within the group. He allowed me small but increasing leadership roles and began to include pieces on some of the band programs which challenged me as a soloist and as a leader of what became my clarinet section. Mm. He coached me through my solo and ensemble music, helped me find my first accompanist, find my first professional teacher, and remained always willing to talk with me after school about the ups and downs of life, relationships, uh, which I was facing during those years. Recognizing that my life was turning toward a professional career in music, Steve creatively worked with the school's administration to create an independent study class for me so that he himself could help with some of the basics of music theory and history and give me more time to practice. Those lessons were badly needed and would surely be hilarious to witness now. They probably could have only been given by someone I learned and trusted so well. By the end of my four years with Steve, I had earned the top spot in Allstate Orchestra consecutively. I was given extraordinary chances to solo with my beloved symphonic band. I'd been able to turn my parents into supporters of an admittedly perilous potential career in music, and I'd found something in myself, a confidence I could take with me through each successive failure and success, a belief in myself and the knowledge that someone really believed in me. That was Steve Adams. As I revisit some of these memories now, tears come to my eyes as much as I appreciated Steve at the time, I could never have known the true significance of those and so many others' efforts he'd made on my behalf. However, as I look back now, Steve holds an esteem of my life reserved only for the greatest. Mm -hmm. He, along with Steven Gurkov, Frank Battisti, and Richard Stoltzman, enabled me to become the musician that I am, to make a life giving back those inspirations which brought me successfully into adulthood. Yeah. And it's obvious that none of those other critical influences would have been possible without Steve himself. As in the creation of music itself, great mentors tirelessly strive beyond any humbling realities for the possibility of an ideal, one that can be gone in a cosmic moment, but which may possibly live on, resonating through the continuing souls it reaches. Wow. I know, his father was a, was a poet and that was almost like poetry. Yeah. Man, I wish I was that good at writing. Yeah, he. Uh, I always, I have to think of myself as a writer, and he is amazing. <laughs> and he plays great. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, so thank you for brought for for um, sharing your story, and I think it resonates with so many of us. Um, I know, uh, you know, high school and family are one thing, but then we kind of get to college, and then we find these other mentors along the way. And for me, uh, mine was uh, it was Leslie Morgan. 
Um, Leslie was a, a, at the time a new, a new uh, uh, professor of voice at what was then called the University of Northern Iowa, now just Northern Iowa, surrounded by cornfields in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And um, uh, it was my sophomore year that I, I got her as my, as my teacher. My first year I had, uh, was studying with um, uh, a, a really bad teacher, um, as nicely <laughs> as I can put it. And um, um, this teacher had, between the combination of his uh, bad teaching and my overzealousness zealousness to do everything he said and then magnify it times 200%, I was a mess, oh. a mess. I mean, I, I couldn't sing my way out of a paper bag. I was just a bundle of everything. And she um, saw some promise in me, and she said, it's no problem. We'll just start at the very beginning. And, you know, I, I sang through my nose. I sang with too much tension. I had everything you could do wrong I was doing. And the, I guess the only good part about that is um, since I've done everything wrong, it made me a better voice teacher because I've had to figure out a way to do all of those things. And she was just, um, her ability to say, okay, you have a million things you're doing wrong, but let's take this one today. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And uh, there's a picture of, of uh, Leslie. And, and I have two stories about Leslie. The first one is, the first time I met her, I knock on the door for my lesson and, and uh, she opens the door and she's a really tall lady. Um, you know, uh, I look right at, right at her chest level. You know, she's very tall, vivacious, curvaceous lady. <laughs> very, very nice. And so she opens the door, and I'm in the doorway, and she just kind of, she's looking at me up and down. She's just kind of, and she's just, something's perplexing. And she looks at me, and she says, oh, come in, come in. So I come in, and she says, how tall are you? I said, I'm 5'7". Hmm. She starts looking up and down again, and she says, are you opposed to wearing lifts? I said, lifts? What are you talking about? <laughs> she said, lifts. I said, what are lifts? She said, there's something you put in your shoes and that way you're taller. And I said, well, uh, I, I'm not opposed to lifts. I mean, I, I said, I'm just here for a voice lesson. She said, well, you know, if you're going to be an opera singer, that you're, you can't be shorter than the leading ladies. And I said, oh, I said, I'm not here to be an opera singer. She said, you're not? And I, and I was very young and stupid at that time. Uh, and I said, said something was terrible now. I said, well, if I was going to be an opera singer, I wouldn't be at the University of Northern Iowa in Cedar Falls to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, okay, well, I understand that. I, she said, so why are you here? And I said, I want to learn how to sing. I'm a jazz musician, but I love how to sing. She said, great, we'll do that. And she became such a great uh, inspiration to me and, um, you know, was as much a, a mother figure as she was mm -hmm. a teacher. And at that time, I was going through college, and Michelle and I were so poor. And everybody says they were poor. We were poor. Um, you know, we, we, I learned the art of knowing how many days before the phone gets disconnected, before the power gets <laughs> disconnected. And it was like, okay, well, that one's, that one's two. We're yeah. behind two payments. <laughs> and so we were, you know, kind of like doing the shell game with payments. And, <laughs> and every once in a while, my mom would call, and she'd say, oh, the phone is on. This is great. It's so nice to talk to you. And we were really poor, and we couldn't afford to live in Cedar Falls. So we had this apartment building. We lived in Waterloo, Iowa, which is this really concrete jungle. And it was a terrible apartment. It was $135 a month. Wow. Uh, and that was probably too much. Um, but it was a really, uh, the funny part about it was it was so cheap because I was the super. I was the handyman. <laughs> and if you know me, I can't oh. fix anything. <laughs> I can sweep up stuff along the hallways, but I can't really do anything. So, but it was so cheap, and That's so Michelle's I job. <laughs> exactly. She's the good fixer. Yeah, I was not, but I was the super. So, you know, if if something's wrong with 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 your apartment, don't call me, because I'm not going to be able to help. I can empathize. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, so we were really poor, and um, we had this. We had we had one car, and I remember going out one day to go to church to go direct my little church choir. And I said, Michelle, where'd you park the car? And she says, what do you mean where'd I park the car? I parked it right here. And I said, well, the car's not here. So long story short, we called the police. Someone's stolen our car. And I said, what's your, what's your license plate's number? And there's a you know, little ticky, ticky, ticky. And he comes back and he says, sir, um, we, we repossessed that car this morning. <laughs> oh. And I said, what? <laughs> he, he said, well, you have, to, you have to pay for those payments. <laughs> and I said, I, I thought we'd only, we're behind two. He says, no, you're behind three and it's been impounded. So uh, we didn't have a car. We walked to church. Thankfully, we could walk to church that day. Um, then the next week, I'm, I'm late to my lesson again. I had a 10 a.m. lesson, which I would never do. And I'm late to my lesson. 
I've been riding the bus with all the crazy people. I finally get to school. I'm there. I'm like 25 minutes late because the bus was late. And I knock on the door, and she looks at me, and she says, where have you been? I said, well, I, I you know, I said, I just nothing. She said, why, why, are you on, why are you not on time? I said, well, my car got repossessed, and I have to, I had to ride the bus, and I missed my transfer. And she says, oh. And she said to me, she said, um, <laughs> she didn't say how tall I am. She <laughs> said, <laughs> She said, you know, how much? I said, what do you mean, how much? She said, how much? And she goes over to her, over her desk. She takes out her, her um, checkbook, and she says, how much? I said, it's $900. She writes out the check, and she hands me the check. And she says, if you're going to make a difference in this world, you're going to have to be at your lesson each week on time, and you're going to need a car. And $900 at that point was like $5 trillion to me. <laughs> and I thought, it's one thing to be a mentor. It's another to just say, look, here's a check. And I, 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 I was, you know, I cried all day because it was just, it was so powerful. Mm. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe there is something here. Maybe, and I think what had happened is I think because of that generosity, and a feeling to not let her down. I'll tell you, I was not late for another lesson my rest of my, my college career. And, you know, every time I would try to think of it, she says, it's nothing. Hmm. Just make a difference. Wow. Just make a difference. So that was Leslie. Well, she'd certainly be proud. <laughs> so we have a submission from Bill Smith. Ah, one of your bases. Yes. One of three important musical mentors for me was Don Erb, who taught theory and composition at the Cleveland Institute of Music. My freshman year of college, I was full-time at Case Western Reserve University, but I also took two conservatory classes at CIM, Harmony and Ear Training, both taught by Don Erb. It was with Mr. Erb's strong encouragement that I made the decision to transfer full-time to the Cleveland Institute of Music. My goal was always to sing. The music theory was so I could become a good musician as well. I took voice with Reuben Kaplan, my second musical mentor. Mr. Kaplan was a voice teacher at Cleveland Institute and the director of the choir at Fairmount Temple, one of the largest reformed temples in the USA. I continue to sing in this wonderful temple choir today. I studied with Reuben Kaplan, Don Erb, and my third mentor, Marcel Dick, a Viennese Jew who fled the Nazis, came to America, was the head of the composition department at Cleveland Institute, and became the principal vi violist of the Cleveland Orchestra. Mr. Dick knew and played with such greats as Schoenberg and Berg. I graduated from Cleveland Institute with a degree in theory and composition. A student could not help but learn from the expertise, knowledge, and experience of these three men. They were passionate about their music and their passion was infectious. They were the embodiment of do it well, do it right, and yes, even when as a human beings we may not perform the music perfectly. We must strive for that goal, and we need to do it with love and do it thrillingly. That's a very good, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Well, thank you, Bill, for sharing yeah. that. We appreciate uh, your insight there, and Bill uh, is, a, is a wonderful person and just takes his music making seriously, and now we know why. Yeah. Well, my next mentor um, was... You know, you, you kind of made the joke to your teacher, if, if I was going to be an opera singer, why would I come to college <laughs> here? And I think in terms of conducting or, or whatever I do, you know, people were surprised, well, why are you going to Nyack College? And what people don't know about Nyack College was there was just an esteemed faculty. Um, one of my great mentors, Dr. Um, Glenn Kopanen, um, he was the one that arranged Zion's Walls that every choir in the world has, has sung. Exactly. Um, and he was one of the reasons why I went there. Um, but as you know, I love the flute. <laughs> I, think, I think the flute uh, is, is one of the best instruments out there. And, and it's been a joy to get to know Betsy Traba, who, yep. who has become sort of a mentor to me just kind of reminding me um, of just being good and, and, and being organized and doing what I say I'm going to do. Um, and she's helped me out a lot. But 
Dr. Marie Herseth Keynote uh, was my college professor. And I wish all college students would have a professor like this. Um, she is a Lutheran, and I was a Lutheran, so we had that in, uh, in common. But she was one of the best flutists I think I've heard or, or have performed with. Um, she was the niece of Bud Herseth, who is one of the most important <laughs> trumpet players of our time. I right. uh, was the principal trumpet player of Chicago Symphony for, for a long time. Dr. Keynote um, taught music theory, composition, or music theory, counterpoint, music history, ear training, um, and, and chamber. And I took all those classes with her. And I'd always loved Bach, but she truly was a scholar of Bach's music and is a scholar of Bach's <coughs> music. Um, and she really just energized my love of Bach, of understanding um, the theory components, the historical components, but really was the first person that really helped me to see the theological importance of, of Bach's music. Um, Dr. Keynote was a sub with the New York Phil for years. Uh, you know, she has a picture of her pregnant with, with Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> um, and she tells me the story because everyone in the world knows uh, Ricardo Muti is, oh, is my favorite conductor. And she... she uh, she always told me the story about she played a second flute solo uh, in an orchestra piece and Ricardo Muti walked off the podium and kissed her hand after, <laughs> after she played. Um, but Dr. Keynote just was full of love for her students and as great as she was as a performer and a musician, you know, having wrote articles for the Flute Journal, um, it wasn't about her. And that was one of the things that I wish I would have experienced more from college professors. It wasn't about them. Uh, for her, it was all about the student, mm -hmm. putting the student out there. And she wanted to make sure that we all performed at our best. Um, and she was very diligent at right notes, right rhythm, good intonation. Um, but she just had a heart of gold. And... When I was going into grad school, I needed a place to live because I was living in a literal crack house I, and not, mm -hmm. not even being funny. There <coughs> were drugs sold in the house. There just, it was, and there were some great guys who lived there, but uh, I always call it the Nyack crack house. <laughs> but um, I knew that I needed a place to live where I was going to be safe and could focus on, on grad school. Um, and she invited me to live in her home for two years. Oh, my. Um, and there were times that I couldn't afford to pay rent, and she would turn the other cheek. Um, she gave me so many opportunities to perform. Um, I will never forget uh, her, along with some other friends from orchestras in New York City, um, were in the orchestra when I did my first Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Nice. Uh, just having her there just to champion me. Um, she just had a heart of gold. Um, and like I said, I, I wish every music major in college could have a professor um, of such high integrity but of such love and depth for their students. Mm -hmm. um, the way she interacted with me, um, she made you feel like you were her favorite, even though she didn't have, fa well, I'm sure she might have had favorites, but she made you mm -hmm. feel like you were her favorite. And, and, I, and I definitely felt that pride from her opening her home to me. Um, I remember having to write little pieces for um, one of my, Joan Tower was my composition teacher oh, wow. in grad school. And I remember having to write these pieces for flute. Um, and Dr. Kino would look at them and tell me 
you know, no, that doesn't work, <laughs> or yes, that does work. Um, but it didn't matter how big you got. Um, she she just she loved you and and really devoted herself. Um, I did this flute fest concert back earlier this year, and my buddy Luis uh, was one of the flute players, and because of her. He got to perform for James Galway and do a master class at James wow. Galway. Um, you know, she just, she knows everybody in the industry and you would know it because she is just humble. Um, and it, it reminds me of just the fact that those who are good at what they do have no reason to be arrogant or put airs on about themselves because they've accomplished the things you could only wish to accomplish and and have no need to be arrogant so that is that was i think one of the most important um college mentors um that i had that's amazing well you i think the the sense of the greater the greater the artist, the more humble they are, mm-hmm. and I think because a great artist realizes how difficult it is to do what we do really well and at the highest level and um, one of the things uh, you know speaking of of as we get a little bit older, you know once we graduate college now it 's like where are we finding those next mentors and mm-hmm. for me, um, I was just incredibly. Uh, lucky to be around um, when uh, Helmut Rilling, who's a, a world-class Bach conductor, one of the very best, has recorded everything of Bach, uh, was a great organist at the time, uh, well, that's Helmut there, and um, uh, he taught, uh, kind of founded the Oregon Bach Festival in Eugene, Oregon, and what uh, uh, he did from the very beginning was he wanted to have a conductor master class, and it was better than most master class. It, it just... Um, there was something about it. It was a lot more intense. Um, it was very uh, genuine. But here again, you have someone who's, who's done everything in their life, and he's happy to just give back to you. And I went there two years, um, and this is a helmet in his usual outfit. Um, <laughs> he, uh, like me, didn't really like dressing up much, but he had this, uh, this leather jacket that was kind of like a suit a little bit. So he had this leather jacket. That is one of the calmest shirts I've ever seen. He usually had a uh, a, a, like an eye blurring kind of pattern that only <laughs> someone from Germany would say, yes, that looks cool. Uh, just really strange. And then he always had about 73 ounces of coffee with him. Nice. Uh, so he would come to class that way. And um, the first time, uh, you know, I learned so much from Helmut, uh, a lot about just structure of the piece, score study. Um, one thing he ta- taught me that I thought was really important, he does um, everything by memory. Um, and you just go to yourself, well, he must just have a photographic memory. No, he sits down every day and spends hours looking part by part by part. Even he may have conducted the, the B minor mass 100 times or 200 times, but yet if you see him production week, what is he doing? He's at home, he's sitting down, usually at the pool with that leather jacket and a giant cup of coffee, <laughs> um, you know, working on his music. And, you know, he's so dedicated to his craft. And one of the things... I always thought was he he's electric in performance mm. in rehearsal you know he's a good technician but there was something about it and I asked him I said you know why, why what happens when when you're in performance why is it so different and he says he says you have to save something for the performance yeah. he says don't give it all away in rehearsal then what's what's new he says he says you know you have to be able to be organic in the moment and he said so I do all of my study so that I know these pieces inside and out I rehearse them, I know basically the framework, but he said then in performance, you have to be a performer yourself and that interpretation has to live out of who you are and it can only come with a base of study but also (laughs) a sense of releasing that emotion. And so he was incredible in just saying, you know, don't give it all away, save something. So the performers, sometimes they get kind of used to your your routine. Mm -hmm. And so he was really good at a lot of things. One of the stories I remember my first Oregon Bach Festival, we were doing um, the student conductors. There was only about, I think, maybe 12 of us or something, a very small uh, select group, and it was hard to get into that program. I was so excited I got in, and we were going to be doing, uh, we were going to be conducting um, St. John Passion. So we had this, you know, a lot of music to learn. So I, over the summer, I diligently was going to do all of my practicing, so I was ready for this piece, because this is 
maybe the greatest opportunity I've ever had as a conductor. So I'm all excited about it. And I said, you know what? This is a long darn piece. I gotta figure out how to do this. And I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the hardest stuff first. I'm gonna do the, the, big, cor- the big choruses, all the stuff with very dense texture. I'm gonna do, learn all those first. Then I'm gonna do all the recitative, which are always difficult, and there's so many in that piece. And so I'm gonna get those, then I'm gonna work on the arias, and then at the very end, I'll do the chorales. And the chorales are these little, you know, generally four part, like a, like a hymn tune <laughs> that's very simple, has a couple fermata, you know, it's very easy. I thought, well, I'll do those last because they're the easy pieces. So I remember that last week I was cramming like there's no tomorrow, trying to learn this piece and get it all. I was getting there. And so by chance, I was the second student up and the helmet's there. And he said, well, let's do, let's do one of the chorales. So I thought, great, okay. So I turned to whatever chorale it was and uh, I start conducting and he kind of comes up next to me and he's just kind of looking and he takes my book and he goes, closes it. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm going, I don't know this at all. I'm thinking, and I'm, and I'm thinking, just be cool. Just connect four. Wait until something happens. And he's just, he's just kind of watching me, and I'm faking my way through this corral in a horrendous sort of way. And uh, he's, he's, he, he finally, after he's seen enough, and he stops and he says, why don't you know the corral? And I told him, well, I, I was so concerned about the hard stuff. I worked on all the hard stuff first, and I get, told him this whole routine, and he says, he says, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not music. Mm-hmm. He says, this music is as important as yeah. the most complex thing Bach wrote. And he said, you have to understand that these pieces could be the most emotional moments in the entire piece, but you have to treat it that way in your study. And he says, you know, there's no cutting corners in score yeah. study. You either, you either studied it or you didn't. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, having a really terrible night because I thought, wow, I could not have messed up worse than I did. And, but the lesson was, was good is that, you know, there's, in the simplest phrase, it can be transformative mm-hmm. if you give it enough credit. So that was one of the big learning experiences I had. And I, I had just one other little quick story that, um, you know, he really taught me that if you're going to be a conductor, you're going to have to love score study and you're going to have to live, eat, and breathe it. And I think when you're young, you go, I'm good enough, I can generally do it. Yeah, you're good enough to be okay. Yeah. But if you're going to be great, you have to have a passion for it. And I got to watch him put together so many pieces and watch his passion, you know, in his 70s mm. uh, after he, quote, unquote, knew it all. Um, so there was that. But I think the, the second year I came back uh, to the, I did it again. And this year he made me kind of his assistant. Yeah. So I got to be really close with Helmut and work through a lot of stuff. And he said, well, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be the first one up every morning. And it's like, it's like two weeks or three weeks this, this uh, session is. And usually if you do one of these workshops, if you get 15 minutes of podium time a day, it's like that's the most you get. But he says, he says I'm going to be tough on you. But he says, you know, I, I want you to do it uh, and be first every day. I said, great. So I rarely got less than 30 minutes. It was oh. 30, 45 minutes. And he was so hard on me. Uh, but I think he thought, you know, A, I can take it. Yeah. B, I need it and see the students need it because he could, he could tear me up, spit me out, everything in front of class and I would be able to deal with it, to do well. And it got, you know, he told me, he said what was really great about this is having um, me go up every day is that we got the class started in a really elevated way because he says, you know, the best one there and we just want to show that even the best students have so much to learn and I did. And it was a great experience and I remember so many things that I learned about from Helmet, but one of the things that really struck uh, a chord is we were, we were um, um, the great thing about the Oregon Bach Festival is you're working with professional orchestra, professional soloist, professional chorus. So it's a chance to elevate your craft. Mm-hmm. And what was uh, great about that is, is he, Helmet would tell when these sessions that you play what you see, you sing what you see. Don't, don't make the conductor better. If the conductor slows down, you slow down. Yeah. The, you know, so they were kind of used to really following these conductors, even though all of us were, were struggling at times. And um, so his, his concept was he wanted to teach people how to hear balance from the podium. And so people that don't conduct a lot, um, what it sounds like on the podium is very, very, very different than what it sounds in the house. Yeah. But after, over time, um, as a conductor, you get a sense of what that kind of non-balanced sound is and you know when it sounds like this in the podium I know what it sounds yeah. like out there and so it's a really important gift because you can't be running back in the house 500 times yeah. during, a, during a rehearsal and you know now I'm lucky because I have you and 
and you're out there to say, well, maybe this, maybe that, but it's really nice. But the, the idea here was Helmut said, you know, let's train people to know what it sounds like because you have to be able to balance on the podium. Yeah. So long story to get to this funny line. So um, one of the conductors is up there. I'm standing in the back holding probably his giant coffee, and we're standing back watching, and it's, he's doing, I think, something from Jesu Mina Freude, and it is just a mess. The <laughs> orchestra's not playing together. The, even the choir isn't together with it. It's, it's just a hopeless mess, and it's just atrocious. So, he's, so finally, you know, he's, he's conducting away, and Helmut gives him the, the thing to come out into the house and hear what it sounds like. And the minute he turned around... <laughs> everything lines up. I mean, it, it was like, wow, is that amazing music? And Helmut looked at me and he says, um, remember, a conductor should always be helpful. Mm. And I thought, okay, helpful, that's good. He goes back up there, sounds like crap again. He comes back out, <laughs> lines up, and he looks at me and he says, that conductor is not very helpful. <laughs> Which is true. So, I mean, there, I, there's a lot of things that uh, he taught me. But he had a great sense of humor and a humbleness about him. And I remember I was so, I, I was trying to get my, my, my really great job, my next big job. And I, I was so embarrassed. And I said, because, um, you know, you're going to an international caliber going, can I get a letter of recommendation? And I'm thinking, he's going to say no. And he says, yes, I'll take care of that. No problem. I'm happy to. And I thought, well, that, I'm never going to get that letter of recommendation. <laughs> Two weeks later, here it comes on the International Box Stuttgart Academy. And, you know, the, the three paragraphs he wrote um, gave me the confidence to really mm. aspire to something amazing. So my buddy Helmut, he is a master, uh, a master craftsman. He taught mm. me so much. I was just lucky um, to be there for those two years, and I worked with him after a couple projects. So... He was a true artist, and our next submission here is another great artist, Jeffrey Beagle. Yes. Fantastic pianist. Um, he was last with Key Corral when we did the Beethoven Choral Fantasy mm -hmm. and just knocked it out of the park. There's Jeffrey now, and he's a, just a, a dear friend, and he has this submission. Although there have been many inspirations through the years, I would have to say that Adele Marcus was the one. As tough as she was and hard on her students, she knew it was her job to transcend tra traditions from her teachers in the past to her students. This included the sound world of great composers and our individual artistry. Not only the classic repertoire, she instilled with her and her students the constant search for new music and our duty to bring a new music to life. As a result, I made sure many composers were commissioned to compose new music for piano and orchestra as well as piano, orchestra, and chorus. Beyond this, her high standards for excellence as a musician and pianist were her driving force. Whether or not it upset us or inspired us, she knew that the enemy of great was good. She often said, better you should hear it from me than the critics. <laughs> Two wonderful things she did, she said, don't just see it, look at it. Don't just hear it, listen. Those are great teaching moments, and uh, when you hear uh, Jeffrey play, there is such a, a, a complexity of what he's doing that sounds effortless, mm -hmm. and I think he you obviously lives by those words that he, that he taught, and I think there's so many um, wonderful people that we meet in our lives uh, in our adulthood. I know you have one that uh, is a pretty amazing man. Yeah, so, you know, I... I have to give a little background to, to set us up to talk about this next mentor. As I said earlier, I, you know, my mom put me in conservatory and I was very young. And so I was taking music history and music theory and, and harmony and all, ear training and all those things. Um, but because my mom would never let me take piano lessons, I'd never, ever uh, knew what any of the note names on the piano was. Oh, wow. And so in high school, I was sitting there um, trying to remember this hymn we had sang in church that Sunday, and I was trying to play it, and had just kind of figured out where the harmony went, and it was playing by ear. So I always, always had a pretty good ear. Um, and this this girl came up to me, and she's like, "How do you, how are you playing all this stuff?" I was like, "Well, I'm playing it by ear." She's like, "She's like, you can't read music." I was like, "I don't even know what the note names are on the piano." <laughs> <laughs> so she sat there, and she's, she went through all the note names on the piano. And so then I was able to look at sheet music, and because I'd studied violin and viola, mm -hmm. I could read all four clefs, 
I had, you know, started doing some uh, score studying when I was in high school just to train myself to be able to read clef. So I was able to start, you know, actually playing sheet music, um, and it started playing the organ. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I went to college first here in Florida, um, and then I, you know, I hated it, so I was like, <laughs> I'm going go to go to New York, um, and along with Dr. Kopanen and along with uh, Dr. Keynote, there was a guy there by the name Craig Williams, and that's a picture of my there college graduation with with Craig and had never taken an organ lesson in my life didn't know didn't know yeah. what the heck I was doing but I said I'm gonna go to college and become an organ major and so I was I that summer before I went to college I found two organ teachers <laughs> and I would take two two-hour lessons a week so I had four hours of organ oh. lessons a week for three months. That's a lot of practice to get ready for four hours. Yes. And <laughs> one guy gave me the keys to the church. And so I could go in any time and practice. And the other guy, I record, I will never forget this. I don't know. I don't think there's any college student over the last decade that can say that they recorded their college audition on floppy disk. <laughs> 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 I recorded my college audition on floppy disk, and I sent it in. <laughs> and they, Dr. Kino, Dr. Kopanen had to uh, transfer, transfer to CD to give to the other students, or other professors. And Craig accepted me into the organ program knowing that you know, I had limited skills, but he saw the fact that if someone can can take three months of organ lessons and <laughs> get this far, he was just like, I'm I'm sure that after four years of of college, right. you know, this will happen. And so I went to Nyack as an organ major, um, and then he would invite me to be his associate at West Point for three years. And Craig was the first full Curran organ scholar at Westminster Choir College, had done his master's in piano performance at uh, Juilliard, and his undergraduate music theory teacher was Morton Lawrenson oh in California. Gosh. And Craig just opened up so many possibilities, but he intentionally became a mentor he saw just he saw such promise as a musician and unfortunately and this is partly why I hate handbells uh, was I was on tour with the handbell choir who goes on handbell choir I tour, but yep. I had all the low bells terrorizing people all over the world and in the last performance I just heard a crack in my wrist and that ended my collegiate organ career. Um, oh my. And so all because of handbells. All because of handbells. Oh. And so the School of Music started a conducting degree for me. Um, oh, wow. And Craig was my champion in that. Um, he still let me work for him at uh, the Cadet Chapel, which houses the largest all-pipe church organ in the world. Um, but the thing about Craig is how many of your mentors share their family with you? Mm -hmm. And Craig's wife and kids are three of the most wonderful, wonderful people I've ever met. Um, Craig and his wife were here the day Jen and I got engaged. Uh, and it was special to be able to share that with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Craig and his whole family came to our wedding right. and his daughter sang the Lord's Prayer. Um, and, I mean, Craig is just is really one of the greatest organists. I mean, he's had high school students winning major organ competitions. Um, but he just was my biggest champion um, in anything that I set my mind to, especially as a conductor. 
Um, so to see him pretty much at every major milestone of my career in life thus far as a musician, um, the, the day I conducted Beethoven's Ninth, uh, the piece performed beforehand was the Gilmont Organ Concerto, mm-hmm. which is, f- as a conductor in an orchestra, I mean, the orchestra, it's, it's difficult, but the organist is just constantly just, just going and going and mm-hmm. going. Um, but he, he's just been there. Um, he, was one, he was my predecessor at my job in New York City at uh, Calvary Baptist in Midtown Manhattan across from Carnegie Hall, and, and he was just always someone I could call and talk to and say, how do I navigate the stupidity of politics here? <laughs> um, and Craig has just been a major support in my musical career, but also in my, in my faith. And he's, he's always championed me not to be a great musician, but uh, a sincere Christian um, as has Dr. Keynote, and so I, I don't think I would be where I am or have had the experiences of I, I've had um, right now um, if it were not for Craig Williams. Um, I remember when I got my acceptance letter to Bard Conservatory um, and got to go study with the guy who replaced Robert Shaw at the <laughs> Collegiate Corral. Um, you know, just as great of musical experience as I had at Bard Conservatory and, and studying with some of the best, um, nothing can ever replace um, m- Craig's mentorship to me just because he is one of the best. Yep. Um, and another person who's very humble um, and has just has raised him and his wife Lee have just raised two incredible children who are great musicians and and I hope you know I can have a legacy like that with my own kids uh, when 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 Jen and I have children so yeah that's Craig, and what's wonderful is Craig is still near life. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I wonder if he's ever actually at the Naval Academy. I always feel like he's here. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we stand on the, on the shoulder of, of giants, and I know um, the biggest giant uh, in my, my life was with Robert Shaw, and I, I first met uh, him in 1996 uh, as part of a choral workshop in um, uh, Carnegie Hall, and we were doing Verdi Requiem, and it was really... Uh, a beautiful experience and um, it was the last three years of his life and I learned more in those three years than my combined 50 years uh, there's just no one that can I, I tell people I was uh, I was ma- I was maybe a choir director mm-hmm. and when I met Shaw and watched him and learned from him I became a true conductor mm. and I learned so much from him. I learned how to get large forces to speak together. Yeah. You know, that's uh, an art in itself. Um, I learned things like being able to prioritize a rehearsal. He was a genius at that. And, you know, I don't know how many times even a, a, a traditional, a, a really gifted conductor is at a dress rehearsal and you look at the clock and you go, ain't no way they're going to get through everything. Um, you know, because they don't prioritize. and. He would used to say, I remember there was one that time he was doing the, uh, the Haydn Seasons, and the Haydn Seasons, 135 minutes. So he goes up to the podium, it's dress rehearsal, and he says, well, all right, so it's a two-and-a-half-hour rehearsal. We've got a 15-minute break. That means we have one minute to rehearse. And everybody chuckled. But the reality is, that's how much time, because if you're at a dress rehearsal, every note better be played. Yeah. That's a dress rehearsal. And, you know, it's such a simple thing, but, like, if you're doing a Britain War Requiem, it's 80 minutes. So you have a two and a half hour rehearsal, you have a 15 minute break, you have five minutes of tuning, on the front end of each half you have 50 minutes to rehearse. Yeah. So if you're gonna play every note, you gotta have, you're gonna have 50 minutes that you can, you can work and shape a piece. So that means every time you stop, is it worth stopping? Yeah. And, and the, there's so many times when you start at the beginning of something and you start conducting and you go, oh, I hear that, I gotta stop and fix that, mm-hmm. oh, I gotta stop that. 
And then pretty soon, you're a half an hour into the rehearsal and you're an hour and 15 minutes behind. Yeah. And it's just about prioritizing and trusting. And he would say, you know, your job is not to stop and tell them everything that's wrong. When you're prioritizing, you're listening for a couple things. You're going, okay, that I'm going to have to go back and fix. Mm -hmm. This I'm going to have to fix, but I can probably fix that next rehearsal. And then there are other things which I never thought about. He said, these are all the things that if you just shut up and don't say anything, will get fixed. So you have to say, okay, well, you know, these are professional musicians. It's a good choir. The second time through, they're going to fix those things. Yeah. So it was a matter of saying, you're not just prioritizing a rehearsal. You're listening to all of these things going on. You're going, that goes in that bucket. That goes in that bucket. That goes in that bucket. And then you listen the next time. You go, well, did it fix itself? Yeah. Oh, it didn't. Okay, now I have to address it. But it was a, a very practical way of doing that. I learned... Every, almost every rehearsal technique I do now in my rehearsals, I gained from, from watching him work. Hmm. And it's just so many things that are, are, are so significant. He um, had a great way of taking these huge masterworks and in production week, dividing them into four rehearsals so that everything got accomplished, but they were the most efficient. And it wasn't starting at A and going to B. It was maybe starting with... Um, all the big pieces first to make sure everything is, every, all of these big pieces, these structural points are, are ready to go. And then you go to other things. And then you can let half the orchestra go and part of the choir go, and they're yeah. very happy. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. But it's just a matter of, I know with, uh, with uh, something like, uh, with Liza Rushdie-Tev, he would do one rehearsal with just, um, just continuo and the soloist. And, you know, that way you don't have to waste time in the full rehearsals. But he was a master at uh, maximizing time. And when you're a young conductor, what you don't have enough of is enough rehearsal. So that was... That's very true. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're rushing. But it, it, was, it was, to me, really ex incredible to just get that idea. And I remember um, he was doing uh, double choir Mountets of Bach. Um, and uh, he was experimenting with um, the performance practice of these double choir motets being doubled by oboes and English horns and bassoon and then a continual for each group. And I was, I was asking some questions about that because I never had, had not heard them done that way. Um, incidentally, Helmut does the same thing. And I was asking some questions and he answered every question I had. And then finally he said, you know, he says, I think you'd learn a lot more if you just saw the orchestra parts. Mm. He says, you know, because what I, and he's one of those, like Helmut, but more so, um, edits everything. So er, all the information is there in these parts. So he's, and, and if you're, you know, conductors are like, my parts are like my children. I don't want anyone messing with them. Um, you know, they're really important. And he said to Nola Frank, his assistant, he says, give Joe um, all of the orchestra scores for everything we're doing this week. Uh -huh. And so I got Zinga Dem Heron and Come Music Come, Come and uh, Haydn Mass and a Coronation Mass and something else. I got all these stuff. And he said, just take them. And he says, photocopy all of them. And then you'll be able to go back at any time and study these and understand why I did what I did, and you'll be able to go to it. And I know um, um, Robert died in, in uh, January of 99, and I, would, I still go back to those parts, and I look at them, and I understand it's like he's there with me. Because hmm. now I have the, the depth of experience to know exactly what he was thinking when he put that there, yeah. or this Boeing here, or those kinds of things. And it's like the master class from Robert never stops. Hmm. And I know we're going on. We thought we could get this another six hours today. <laughs> um, I think we're going to just make it. Um, but um, one other thing I just wanted to mention about him was um, a lot of times when you're, you, you have a mentor, you go to these workshops, and then the board choir and orchestra, when you get back, you do all that stuff you learn. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when you're a young conductor, what you end up doing is you have to kind of mimic yeah. Um, so you come back and you mimic all the things that you've learned. And, you know, you might do that for two weeks, three weeks. But then I think it's kind of like wearing your dad's suit when you're, a, when you're eight years old. And you go, well, I look good in this, but it kind of doesn't fit yet. Yeah. And so I think you have to say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not wear the shoes. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm going to take that sleeve, but I'm going to alter it a little bit. I'm going to add it to me. And so what happens is you, you start by mimicking. And then after you've done that, then you say, well, how does this fit into my life as a conductor? Yeah. And you start pulling hopefully the best pieces from all of these um, inspiring people, and then you become the conductor you are. So the, I, I know that, yes, this is, a, this is something that's maybe not exactly what Helmut did, but it's part of, part of how I think about it now. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of, of Robert. Um, and what I think about, uh, about Robert is um, 
there's a lot of things that uh, I almost, almost always cry, so we'll see if I get through it. But um, he, to me, he was like a gardener. I know that sounds really weird. But he was like a master gardener, and he, he knew how important it was to water, to feed, to replant, plant, to repot, to prune, um, to nourish, to nurture um, his choirs, his orchestras. And they were like a living, breathing entity. And he didn't take a day off. He was there every day. And he wasn't just a guest conductor that's going to come in and sprinkle pixie dust and leave. He was involved. And um, he would always wear the same, the same outfit, some baggy blue, blue uh, pants and uh, these old uh, button-down blue shirts. He even looked like a gardener. Mm. Um, you know, when he walked in, you wouldn't think that that was the Robert Shaw. Yep. It's just a guy who kind of walled up and did his thing. And what I remember most about... Um, so many of these experiences was he, he had an ability to be incredibly humble and very detailed, but really giving. And I don't know what he saw in me or what, but, but he changed my, my life in so many different ways. And I think it was because of his humbleness, of his gentleness, of his, um, you know, deeply spiritual, maybe not religious, but deeply spiritual um, an incredible man, and, I, and, and when he passed away in January of 99, I said, I have to go to the funeral. I have to, I have to get there to say thank you to this man who's done so much for me. And see, I thought I was going to cry. And um, I remember going there, and it was uh, at, the, at the, uh, what was called the Woodruff Center then. It was where the orchestra performed, and it was completely full of everybody. And they had these huge, enormous um, hallways, and they were filled with people, and they were streaming out in the hallways, and out on the lawns, they were broadcasting the service, and there were families, on, there mm. were thousands of people that came to celebrate this man, and I remember in, you know, a lot of us were conductors all over, I remember we were talking before the service, and everybody had 15,000 Robert Saw mm -hmm. stories, and we were all touched by um, the legacy he left in all of us. And, um, you know, I remember when um, um, Sylvia McNair sang um, At the River, just the Copeland piece um, with piano. And, you know, I'll never forget that moment because it was kind of like, I felt like his legacy mm -hmm. is living in all of us. Wow. See, there we go again. I knew I was going to, now, did we, did we ever see that photo of, there he is. Yeah. So that's, that photo up there is, um, um, it's a service bulletin from his, from his service. And I have it framed, and it's above my desk, and it grounds me and keeps him in my heart and my mind. <coughs> it's where I study my scores and prepare and feel like he's with me every day. So I knew I was going <laughs> to... That's okay. I can't talk about him, but I, there must be something else to read after this. There but is. I, there I just want to say that through his scores and his legacy, 20 years later, he's still teaching me every day. Wow. Uh. Well, I, hey, that is, you know, I, I, I think as musicians, it's not just the, it's, it's the musicianship that originally attracts you to a mentor. Right. And I, and I know with Craig, just his, just his sense of, of harmony, his, his ability to, to reharmonize hymns, um, the special attention he gives to the music of Bach, um, is really what drew me to him and, and wanting to, to study with him. Um, and then you get to know them as a person or you get the opportunity to study with them or, or just sit underneath their, their tutelage. Right. Um, and your life has changed because you see firsthand how music has completely encapsulated their life Right. in every aspect of their life um and it just it just it just does something to you i'm going to skip ahead a few i apologize to those who sent some in but we are well, it took running a long time out of i was crying through. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot i can't cry and read at the same time we are it's running out of time so i'm going to go to this very special one before i met my vocal coach and music mentor i was enthusiastic volunteer singer in high school for churches and in small local ensembles. I was, I was unfamiliar with proper vocal, proper vocal techniques, anything to do with music theory. Most composers 
much of the standard choral repertoire or how to count in 6, 8, 9, 8, or 12, 8, let alone ever having seen anything resembling what Benjamin Britten did with much of his compositions. <laughs> I sang along with the radio to Top Pop 40 and picked up, what I, picked up what I generally needed to know through repetition in my choir rehearsals. I did not know how to read music. I did not know how to read music thanks to six years in band. I'm sorry. I did know how to read music. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with me today. I did know how to read music thanks to six years in band, but that's about where my formal music education ended. Through his gentle leadership, keen ear, and positive reinforcement, I became his go-to soprano for all of his mixed voice ensembles. For over 30 years under his guidance and encouragement, I have learned innumerable skills on how to be a professional vocalist, face any situation in any piece of music, gain personal and professional confidence, received countless solos and special opportunities, became his confident, confidant, his sounding board, his in-house librarian, an amazing chef, and his <laughs> wife. My mentor has been and continues to be the always amazing Maestro Joseph Caucus. Oh, that's very sweet, Michelle. That is sweet. <laughs> I, I wish my wife liked me like that. <laughs> well, it takes time. It takes time. I guess so. It does take time. Yeah, I don't think she, Michelle would not have written that tw 20 years ago. I can guarantee you that. So I, <laughs> I'm wondering if we want to kind of close out and maybe post some of these stories. I think on so. I have two we should do, though. All right. I know we're, we're going along, but we have two that I want to make sure we do. Let's, um, we have a really wonderful um, one from Brad Diamond. Brad Diamond is in the picture uh, you'll see in a little bit. And Brad is one of my, here he is. Brad's the third one from the left. There's uh, the big fat guy, and there's Mary Wilson, who I love and adore. Um, this is our creation soloist, Brad Diamond and Kyle Farrow. Uh, and, he, and Brad uh, sent this submission. When I arrived at Westminster Choir College as an undergraduate voice performance major, I knew only two things. First, that I needed to go to college. My parents had made that abundantly clear. And second, that I enjoyed singing in choirs. I had no idea where to go or what to study. I had been a leader in my high school choir for four years and had always enjoyed singing. So where does a self-proclaimed choir nerd go to college? Westminster Choir College <laughs> sounded like a great fit and had come highly recommended by several trusted adult musicians. As far as I knew, studying voice at the collegiate level was just going to be an extension of high school. You sing a lot in choirs, you learn some solo vocal music, and the rest sort of works itself out, right? Hmm. Well, it took one of the most important mentors of my life to help me understand what real vocal study was. Lindsay Christensen was then the chair of voice department at Westminster Choir College, and she lovingly but firm firmly accepted no excuses from me and insisted on real dedication to my new craft of classical singing. I didn't know how to practice, and she taught me. I didn't know the value or, or, or importance of practice, and she helped me discover it. I didn't know what it meant to walk around every day as a vocal artist, and she helped me build mm. the daily discipline to do so. She was a fantastically gifted teacher and mentor, and I am thankful for her every single day of my life. Wow. Ooh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brad. And then uh, uh, since she was in the, in the, I have one more from Mary Wilson. Um, Mary Wilson is my buddy. And we do a lot of mentoring in Key Corral through our voice lessons, our student scholar program. And uh, I, I thought this was a really good one. So thank you, Mary, for sharing this really um, wonderful submission. It says, she says, one of my biggest mentors was my graduate voice teacher, John Stewart. After I finished my undergraduate degree at St. Olaf in Minnesota, I went immediately on to the New England Conservatory in Boston. I hated it. <laughs> I was so not ready for that cutthroat environment and quit after a year. I gave up singing. I sang in a few professional choirs and did a season or two of opera chorus, but really, I gave up pursuing a solo career entirely. The highlight of that time was meeting and marrying my amazing husband, Todd, and moving to St. Louis on a whim. In St. Louis, I was working as a paralegal and was seriously considering going to law school. If you know Mary, wow, <laughs> I can't imagine that. But <laughs> when this strange man heard me sing a solo in church on a random Sunday morning, and he said to me, I should come and study voice with him at Washington University in St. Louis. That man was John Stewart, head of the voice department. The next day, an offer for a full ride showed up. Amazing. 
Needless to say, I didn't go to law school, and he completely changed the direction of my life. John taught me so much during our two years of study together. I loved being in his studio with photos of him in great roles covering the walls. It was so inspiring. I learned to trust my musical instincts again and to freely explore my voice. He gave me back my confidence, and together we did the Met competition and made it all the way to the Grand National Finals. It was a thrill. To this day, I trust his advice and his reassuring voice. John had so many great pieces of advice. My favorite, anyone can get hired. The secret to a long and wonderful career is to get rehired. John changed the direction of my life. He made me a singer again. I hope he knows all he did for my life. And um, just to, um, you know, to have someone with such a great voice, one of the greatest voices of our time, hmm. that was ready to be a paralegal. I know. That That's would be crazy. a waste. So thank you, Mary, for sharing that. <laughs> and it was great to have uh, Mary and Brad and so many of the people share. Yeah, well, before we go today, I just want to share one last story. Um, I came to Venice three years ago, um, and I was hoping to find a voice teacher. And this world-renowned world Basso Profundo walked through the doors <laughs> of the fellowship hall here at Venice Presbyterian Church, and I got the opportunity to start studying the role of Mendelssohn's Elijah with him. Um, and it was because of Ken Cox that uh, my voice has doubled in size, my voice has is, is, is gotten better, um, and it's just, he's just been really great to study with. I've gotten to study with some great singers in my day. Um, but all that in preparation to prepare to sing for what I believe has become my greatest mentor, um, and that is you. Uh, you know, at, ev at every stage of your life, you need great mentors. And, you know, I feel like so often people try to find a mentor and kind of force their way into a relationship with mentors. And I, I'm thankful I've never had to do that. But uh, as a conductor, um, just moving here, hoping to find someone who would continue to help me flourish. And uh, your sensitivity to the score, your, your necessity for excellence, uh, your necessity for great intonation, um, and your ability to be a team player in the music making experience um, is something that I, I'm learning to be better at. Uh, and that's because of your leadership. Uh, it's because of your humility. Um, and, you know, it just, I love you. You know, you really, you really have become, I think, one of the greatest friends and confidants outside of my wife. Uh, that I've ever had and will will ever have in my lifetime, um, and I I pray that whether I'm here or gone for many years, we will have the experience of not just making music together, but uh, drinking handles of vodka and eating lots of meat. Well, we've been <laughs> practicing on that. We have. Well, you know, I'm, I'm I love you too, and you're a, you're a brother to me, and. Um, much younger brother, but uh, <laughs> but I think what's and darker <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, but I, you know, you have such you have such a gift to give, and you know when you talk about paying it forward, you know I'm at that point in my life now where um, thinking about that is more more a part of it. And what I love to see in you um, is when you know we've been teaching voice lessons together and some of those things and doing outreach together and. Um, you know, a little bit like the Grinch. I think your heart has grown six, seven <laughs> times more fully. Um, not that you were Grinchy before, but it's just I was. <laughs> your your heart for your heart and for and compassion for people and music and your faith has just um, just exponentially grown in the in the few years we've known each other. And and you know, you're the easiest person to to invest in because I know. Every, th every minute, every second that gets invested in you is going to reap benefits down the road in ways that we may never know um, in the next year or two, but you know, in 10 or 20 years when you look back, you'll see all the different people that you've touched. And I think yep. that's, 
that's the whole thing is, is um, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been given a gift, it's, it's our responsibility to give that gift to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to give in small ways and, and grateful for our friendship and Ditto. our ability to talk well past an hour. <laughs> well, <laughs> to the audience, we want to thank you for joining us for this long but great conversation. You made it. Uh, as often as I often do, I appeal to you, the, the listener and the watcher, for um, you to, to invest in Key Corral. And I really want to make that abundantly clear again. Um, Key Corral is an organization that is, is reaching beyond its walls into the community to help and to shape a life. I was so excited to, to get that call this week that she, this lady had found a violin student. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that. In the, in the voicemail, she said, this is my Jamal project. And that really, <laughs> that made me feel good. But what you heard today here, what you heard here today is what Key Carell is doing every day. And so I would really invite you and ask that you consider uh, making a donation to Key Carell and investing um, in the walls of Key Corral and the music that we're doing now, but you're really investing in a future generation of music makers and world changers. So it was great to connect with you all every Friday. And remember, if you are catching us for the first time, you can always check out our other episodes on our YouTube channel anytime after the premiere. If you enjoyed these conversations, please help us spread the word and let your friends and family know about Morning Coffee and Maestros. And we are excited about our next time on Morning Coffee and Maestros. We'll be exploring the classical music of Mexico. Jamal and I will uh, confess that we know almost absolutely nothing about (laughs) music uh, or composers of Mexico. So we are looking forward to learning more and sharing it with all of you. But to do so, we are inviting our first ever guest on Morning Coffee. And Maestros, our, our friend Fernando Traba, principal bassoon of the Sarasota Orchestra, will be joining us. Fernando is from Mexico, a phenomenal musician, and has an incredibly interesting personal story to share. Not only will he be our first guest, he'll also be playing for us at the end of the episode. I know, but we're still working on a good title for our next show. We have a few. There's, there's Cinco de Mexico. That's not bad. <laughs> we have Riches from the South of the Border. I think my, my favorite one is Notes from Behind the Wall. Notes from the Behind the Wall. Yeah, we, I do too, but the network execs, uh, they thought that was probably a little too political. Probably.